Good afternoon, and welcome to AFUSA's Authors Alive book talk on Tatiana de Ronay's edge of your seat, intriguing, thrilling, and emotional thriller, Flowers of Darkness. My name is Renee Ketchum, and I serve on the board of the Federation des Alliances Francaises in the USA, in charge of cultural offerings in one film, one federation. We're here are a few of our national events coming soon. Apéro National French Conversation Group, Le Métro dans les Arts, which is fabulous with Charles Coulon. Meet Martin Walker, who I'm sure you've all heard about, and then some other upcoming events. So visit your local chapter and go to afusa.org to see what's coming up. So a little bit of housekeeping, please stay on mute during the presentation. Um, we'll use the chat feature for submitting questions after the interview with Joe Myers. Um, and again, you can read here in the event of unusual technical issues, sign back in. This event is being recorded and will be one hour. Tatiana Doroné is author of over 10 novels, including the New York Times bestseller, Sarah's Key, that I think we've all read and enjoyed. She's named one of the top 10 fiction writers in Europe. Joe Myers is arts writer and film reviewer for more than 30 years and is director of programming for Focus on French Cinema of the Alliance Francaise of Greenwich, which is going on as we speak. So I'm thrilled to welcome everyone. Welcome, Joe, and welcome, Tatiana, and we look Thank forward you. to a great talk. Thank you, Renee. Uh, this is really a, such a pleasure for me to be asked to do this interview. Uh, this book is, is fantastic, and it's my favorite kind of book, which is it's not easy to describe. You really have to read it to appreciate the way it blends genres and, and the plot development. I, I mean, I read it in two sittings, and... Mm -hmm. uh, just could not put it down and, and stayed up very late one night to finish it off. So uh, it's a wonderful book. And I don't wanna give away much of the plot. Some of that maybe will come through in the questions, but I think the surprises in the book are very important. But Tatiana, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is, uh, it's very intriguing, the timeline of this book. I mean, we know pretty much at the start that we're not in the present and we're not in the distant future. We're in some near future that we sort of get a more of a feeling for as we get into the book. It seems to me that it might be more difficult to write about the near future than to write some dystopian novel set 300 years mm -hmm. from now. What were the challenges of imagining life, culture, all of that stuff, maybe 15 to 20 years down the road? Thank you, Joe. Um, and hello, everybody. It's very nice to see you, although not in real life. <laughs> I wanted to write about the future, um, which is unusual for me because until now, I've, I've usually only written about the past or the present. And so this is something that was very new to me, but I didn't want to get into a far away future because I'm not that kind of writer. Science fiction doesn't really tempt me. I was more inspired by, I guess, um, series, TV, TV shows like, like, like Black Mirror, which, which mm. really show our everyday life, but just taken one step beyond. And so in this case, what I tried to do was to create, um, without giving any dates, because I don't actually, and that's why some people have to like read the book quite carefully to understand when it's taking place. I do give a couple of you know, tips away. I think the reader begins to understand that it takes place roughly 10 years after the Olympic games. We all know, hopefully, that the Olympic games will take place in 2024 here. We're hoping that this is still on despite the pandemic. Um, and so we understand, I think, more or less that it takes place in 2034, which sounds quite far away, but really isn't. But what interested me is we know that the progress of um, artificial intelligence is so rapid, so terrifying at times, that I didn't really have to stretch my imagination um, to portray this. Now, 
let's get this straight right away. This is not a a, a tech savvy book about you know the pro the, the artificial intelligence. I'm not that kind of writer. This is the intimate side of a woman's life, a woman who is confronted with all the unlimitless um, and sometimes quite astonishing progress that artificial intelligence can have in our everyday lives. I mean, even with our phones, even with our computers, we are geolocated. Every, every click, everything we buy on the internet is you know, traced. Big Brother is still watching us. And that um, is something that I didn't invent, okay? <laughs> That's something that's been uh, lurking in our imaginations and actually in our everyday lives for the past, what, I'd say a hundred years. So the feat was to try and make my reader understand that I'm in a very near future, okay? But that I'm not taking you to Mars, for example, or to the moon. I'm, I'm taking you to a Paris that's slightly different because something tragic has happened. But this is really our tomorrow. This is not something that's really, really far away and that we can't relate to. This is really our lives, actually. There, it, this is very similar to what we're living now, except that I just, you know, increase the pressure. And when you talk about being similar to what we live now, that one of the scariest aspects of your story is it presenting really a time when books are in serious trouble. You know, people are reading less. The character, the, the protagonist is an author. And, and, you know, I thought about this a lot after reading your book, that even writers I talked to complained to me about reading less than they did 15 or 20 years ago, both because of social media and because of what they see as an improvement of what's available from streaming services. You know, they get sucked into 10 hour yes. show, 10 hours, That's of right. reading, 10 That's hours right. of reading, not doing. I mean, could you talk a little bit about the future of novels and the book? And you know something, um, I do have good news about this. When I wrote this book two years ago, um, of course the pandemic had not at all hit our lives. So we, we had really no idea of what we were gonna go through. And do remember Joe, that Clarissa is not me. Okay, although she- <laughs> And she's much more anxious and much more pessimistic than I am. She's like, she's like a very worried older sister, okay? But she's yeah. not me. So she's very worried about books and, and books becoming, for example, like, you know, memes on Instagram and people photographing their wonderful bookshelves and not, yeah. not, not even reading the books and, you know, and talking about the beautiful cover of a book and not reading it. That's her, that's her worry. I, I do have to say that I did notice, at least here in France, I don't know if this is the case in, in America, you will tell me, but we have noticed that ever since the pandemic and the bookstores were closed in the beginning, um, when Flowers of Darkness came out here in France, the bookstores closed two days after the, books, the book came out. You can, you can imagine how awful that was. It was just um, amazing that the book did manage to sell, uh, perhaps not as well as it should have, but it did. But then there was this effet secondaire, which, which is really uplifting. And, and maybe you can tell me more about this in the States. We have noticed that uh, us writers and us readers have noticed that ever since the effect of the pandemic, people have been flocking to bookstores. I mean, it's just like bookstores in France have never been more full. It's wonderful. And every bookstore seller that I've spoken to said, just like they said, we've never had such a good year. People have come because they're fed up of Netflix or Amazon, and they just want to go to a place where they can mull around the shelves and pick out something that they, they want to read and talk with us. And also the fact that here in France, we can't do any events, as you probably know. I, I'm not sure if even if in America they're possible. I don't think so. Um, we can't. We cannot do book tours. Um, we cannot go and sign our books, which is, I haven't. I haven't done a book signing for a year. Okay, wow. and, and and this and this is my life. And I had to cancel thirty events. 
um, last year when my when my book came out. So, so there's been this incredible um, elan for writers, um, books, reading. It's extraordinary. Um, I, I find it so positive. Really, it makes me it makes me happy because I really thought at one point that you know people were not going to read. Remember, in the beginning of the pandemic, we were also worried. We couldn't read. We couldn't read and we couldn't write. It was just like being struck by, by this terrifying, all this terrifying stuff that was happening around us. And then little by little, we got back to reading. We got back to writing. At least I got back to writing. And I think that today, I think Clarissa is terribly pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm happy to say that, that, you know, I have a new book coming out in France very soon. And I already have so many readers who are so excited, even though they can't meet me. But I'm lucky to have quite a quite a good community on social media, um, so I can exchange with them and, and talk with them, and they're so excited about books coming out. And we have other authors publishing books this this May. Um, little by little, you know, the restaurants are opening again in Paris, even though the pandemic is certainly not over, and I'm sure it's not in your country as well. And we still have to wear masks and all that. So there's been this incredible um, boom and boost of reading, of books, of anything to do with writing, with, with, with you know, people share their, 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 their coup de coeur online. So, so that is really very good news for, for all of us. So I don't know what it's like in the States. Maybe you can tell me roughly how I mean, that's. I think at first people were so depressed and so sort of scared uh, about what the pandemic, <clears throat> excuse me, was going to be that they sort of wanted passively to just let television wash over them, you know, and I was even in the same mood where I couldn't concentrate as much, you know, on a book. But as a couple of months went by, then I just started diving into books. And I have found here that the indie stores that have reopened have, have gone through exactly what you're saying. People are rushing back. And yeah. the, the other good thing I found was that writers found creative ways to communicate with exactly with, the, with their readers I, i'm a friend yeah. of a, a philadelphia thriller writer named lisa scottolini and for her new book she sort of planned out four weeks in advance to do like a, a facebook live interacting with readers you know and presenting sort of the, the the background of her book and i think it was very successful and and i hope that maybe in the future we'll have a combination of virtual exactly. events and real events. You know, people exactly. will use it, use it creatively. Exactly, because you know some people are too shy to come to public events anyway, or sometimes they 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 they're ill or they're yeah. handicapped. You know, so so it's true that um, this has we've been forced into this, and in the beginning we didn't like doing all these online things, but now we've become good at it, and we know that it's wonderful to be able to come into all your homes. You know, I couldn't do that physically. Um, yep. There's no way I'll be coming to the States right now, <laughs> although I long to. <laughs> yeah. So so I think I think that there's something very, very positive with books going on right now. And 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 so so forget Clarissa's pessimism. She's worried I'm not. Great. <laughs> the the one element of the book that, that I found scary too was the privacy issue and the fact yeah. that she moves into an apartment which is set up to be kind of a smart apartment you know where you, you speak to a, a, a virtual assistant a virtual assistant you know and everything's taken care of I mean I don't have Alexa or any of those things they, they scare me frankly you know because I think if I'm going into it where is it going from there exactly you know, when I, when I, Wi-Fi or whatever. And yet a lot of younger people, I find, seem to be willingly giving up their privacy to share incredibly personal things on the internet. I agree. I mean, do, you know, I know you are not the character, but what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on this growing lack of privacy that we seem to have, whether we want to give it up or not? You know, I think that's a, a very important issue right now. Um, I think a lot of people are slowly realizing this, but I think it's very difficult to, you know, our phones, our computers, our screens, we've used them so much in the past year to communicate. Yes. This is how we've been able to work. I mean, you know, I don't know how you or 
I or how any of us would have been able to go on doing our jobs if we hadn't been able to use our phone, use our computers. So in a way, it's very ironic that this pandemic has forced us to use our screens and our devices more than ever. And there's, I mean, unless you go up on an island and you don't see anybody, then you don't catch the virus, great. But then yes. of course you're, you lead the life of somebody who's completely locked away and you can't communicate. So there's a very thin line between learning how to communicate with people and not giving away your entire privacy. And that's what my heroine goes through because she moves into this smart connected home where she thinks everything's going to be you know, wonderfully um, practical for her, that her, her virtual assistant will be able to know what kind of shopping she wants and this, the security and the alarm and the heating and everything. Mm -hmm. But little by little, she feels spied on. And I'm not surprised because frankly, who wants to be spied on every day? I mean, we all know, look at us. We're all looking at our computer. We, we see that little green eye looking yep. at us, okay? Yep. We know we're being recorded for the Alliance Francaise, so we're okay about that. But then what happens? When we turn off our computer and that little green eye we think turns off, but imagine if it didn't. And ima imagine if everything you're saying and everything you're doing is being filmed and recorded and who may be using this. And that's what the whole book is about. Clarissa is convinced that somebody is spying on her for a specific reason, that this residence that she lives in, which is made for artists, She's convinced that little by little, she, she, she becomes a little paranoid. Of course, if she weren't paranoid, there wouldn't be a book, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. because, because the book is built, is fueled by her own paranoia. But I think I would feel exactly the same way. I would be very worried about who is watching me, what for, and why is she being watched you know, all the time? Why is her sleep being recorded? Um, she soon understands that every text message that she sends, every email she sends is going through what she calls their eyes, their hands. So, you know, I think, I think it's not easy. It's not easy at all to be able to control what you do. I mean, we all tell our children, oh, be careful of what you put online. But, you know, a lot of boomers are doing exactly the same thing. I Absolutely. mean, I'm surprised that people, you know, of, of, of my age, um, uh, give, giving their own private lives online as if, you know, as if they didn't care. <laughs> so I think you have to be very, very, very careful. And I think, I think that Clarissa is perfectly right to be paranoid. And I would be too in her shoes, frankly. Yeah. I mean, I get a little paranoid when I get an email from Netflix saying, aren't you going to finish this series that you started? You know, it's like, yeah. And what about getting that email from uh, somebody saying, Oh, you're interested in going to Morocco because you, you, you spoke <laughs> yeah. in front of your, you know, I, I had that Google thing. Yeah. Not, not, not the Alexa one, but the other one. Yeah. And I suddenly realized that everything I was saying, I would get these emails saying you're interested in a trip to Morocco, you know, here's, and then you begin to think, Hey, wait a minute. Listen, you know, there's this, there's a kind of a thunderstorm that's come here in Paris. So I've, I don't know why. So I've just got to turn a couple of lights on. So bear with me. I'm not leaving sure, anywhere. But everything is this huge dark cloud. I don't know if this is <laughs> something to do with flowers of darkness, but it's just like of very course. worrying. So let me just turn, turn on a couple of lights, okay? Sure. I'll be right back. One light here. One light here. Okay. Maybe that looks a bit better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was just getting incredibly dark. Very spooky. I don't know why that happened. Not right. weird. Maybe you can see me slightly better now. And you know, with, with the lack of privacy, what I found really clever was like your character, I found the idea of having an apartment like that seductive, you know, at, at a lower rent. In the all, in the beginning. All of the latest appliances, but she doesn't think about the implications and I didn't really think about the implications until it, be, until it became more and more apparent that she had no privacy whatsoever. I think that that is the scary thing about the future. Um, today, we are offered, you know, so many apps to meet, to date um, for our health, for reading, for traveling, for discovering things. But the amount of information that you give away every time you sign up to this, 
Yes. And then you, you sort of wonder, okay, so all that person who's got that information on me, what are they going to do with it? Right. I mean, even Facebook, we, we, all, we are all on Facebook and we've all seen that terrifying um, uh, show. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, in which, of course, it explains that Facebook does use our data and uh, God knows what they do with it, but it is, it is worrying. So, so yes, but we can't, but on the other hand, we cannot go against the future and against progress. We can't do that. We've, we've gone too far to turn back. So it's up to us to set up those limits. And I think we, we, we each have to do that, really. I agree. E- e- one other interesting aspect of, of modern technology that you also explore that, that I found fascinating was the sex robot angle of yes. your book. And which to me is just- a lot, ex- of peop- a lot of people were so shocked. And, I, and, and this lady <laughs> wrote to me and said, Tatiana, your imagination is just like, you have a very dirty imagination. How could you possibly invent a, a sex robot? I'm like, sorry, lady, I didn't invent anything. They already exist. They're already there. Look them up. She was like, sex robots are among us. And they have been for quite a while. They have been. And, 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 and that's the, the tragedy. And we're smiling about it now because we think, yeah. oh, you know, this would never happen to me. But what would you do if your husband or your wife develops a fascination for a sex robot. Frankly, the, the way artificial intelligence is seeping into our private lives, you know, tailoring these beings, I don't know what to call them, but you know, yeah. frankly, it can be very, very dangerous for our, for our intimacy, for the way for our marital uh, relationships. Um, Daphne du Maurier, who is one of my great, uh, one of, my, one of my favorite writers, she wrote a very disturbing short story when she was 19 years old um, in 1928 or nine called The Doll, okay? W- in which a woman called Rebecca, heralding the very famous novel to come later, it, Rebecca's fiance discovers that Rebecca's in love with this, this um, you know, man-sized sex doll. And of course, everybody was shocked and horrified that such a young writer could imagine that something like this would happen. But in a way, she was ahead of her time. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the 20s, she had already imagined what, we, what we're going through now. And the sex doll angle in the story, to me, was just an extension of what's happening, particularly to young men with the explosion in pornography, you know, that, that is again, available on all of our devices. And I, I have talked Unfortunately. to more than, more than one young woman who has told me that it's kind of ruined sex in a way because men come to that with all these fantasies from professionally produced porno films, you know what I mean? Which have nothing to do with yeah. humanity or love or romance. And I think the sex doll thing is a natural extension of that. It would do exactly what you want it to do. Exactly. And you can, fas- you can fashion these sex dolls. I mean, I, I hadn't realized how sophisticated they are. And, and I found this, uh, it's very easy to look up online, but there's this um, famous lady who has a, a blog in the States and she's into, you know, sexuality and whatever. Yeah. She actually goes to a factory in, uh, in California and she chooses her sex doll. And it's, 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 it's something like out of a, you, you can't believe that this is really actually taking place. And she says, no, no, I'd like him to have blue eyes and, and of course, brown hair or whatever. And he has to be this tall or whatever. And he has to do this and do that. And then she walks off with her sex doll. Okay, l- luckily it ends there. We, we <laughs> see what happens afterwards. Um, but the, the mind boggles, obviously. And then you just think, okay, what if this lady has a boyfriend? I wonder what the boyfriend thinks of the sex doll. And, and in a way, it's made to sound to sound funny, but it isn't. And I think it's a source of, of tragedy. And I think it means also the end of, of human relationships. I mean, if we are to be enraptured by robots and because robots do exactly what we want them to do, then what does that mean about us as humans? Absolutely. I think it's terrible. And I think that that part of the future is that is is very, very dark, really. And and that's Unfortunately, not something that I imagined, despite what that lady said. It's there. 
<laughs> no, it made me think of how far ahead of his time Ira Levin was was with the Stepford Wives, you know, which came out in 72, in which men were willing to kill their wives to replace them with compliant robots. You know, well, people saw that as really bizarre science fiction. But I'm afraid that, you know, we're getting closer. No, it's, to al that. It's, it's already here. It's already here. On a, more, on a more positive note, I, I yes, was let's get to something positive. <laughs> <laughs> I was tickled by one element of our near future, which was the fact that Timothy Chalamet will still be a star that we're very interested in. <laughs> I mean, can you talk a little bit about choosing him out of all of our current performers? So this is um, luckily my husband is not listening to this because he's on a Zoom on the other side of the apartment, so I can speak freely. Uh, in the old days. When I was a teenager, I had a crush on like that tennis player, Bjorn Borg. I don't know if you remember yeah. him, the Swedish tennis player. I don't know why I had, a, I had this intense crush on him. And then, of course, there were these, these actors that I admired, like, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis or, or maybe uh, Jeremy Irons. And then one day, I happened to see a movie called uh, My Beautiful Boy and then another one called Call Me By Your Name. yes. And I just discovered this extraordinary young actor who's actually Franco-American. Yes. So a bit like me, because I'm Franco-British. Right. And he's completely fluent in both languages. And that fascinates me as well, as you know. And I just happened to really, I, I can't say it's a crush, but I suppose it is in a way. But I, ha I had to try and think of an actor that would, that would be young enough to be still young in yeah. 15 years. And he's only what, 25? So I thought, right. fine, he fits the picture. And he's and you can tell that he's a you know, he's he's a, a fabulous actor and he's going to be there for, for, for quite a while. So if if any of you have his phone number or his email, <laughs> um, just tell him that he's in my book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean he of of the young actors, he really stands out from the crowd as a personality. He does. The way he looks, the way he behaves—he he really else. does. And 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 I've seen I've seen him also uh, giving when he comes here to Paris, he gives his interviews in French, and you know he he's completely fluent. He's 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 well, his dad's French, and that's all. That's also very interesting for me because, as you know, my book explores people who speak yes. in two languages, and I think, you know, I think Timothy's a great great actor, and he he's going to have a, a a glorious future. I agree. You know, I'm a real movie nut. So I reading the book, there were a few times where I almost flashed back to movies that I've seen. Like there's a moment where she sees just the cigarette in the dark. She becomes sort of a slightly voyeuristic about her neighbors. And I couldn't help but think that creepy moment in Rear Window where he, that's exactly what Stuart yeah. sees. Now he knows the guy is still there. Exactly. I mean, was that exactly. drawn directly from that or was that sort of... Um, it's true that many of my books explore places and neighbors and, and houses and secrets. Um, so it's true that all the, that, that part where Clarissa is, you know, drawn to what's going out, going outside her, you know, everything that's going on inside her window. She can't sleep. She moves into this apartment and she can't sleep. So she spends a lot of time spying on her neighbors. And then one evening, of course, she uses her little field glasses just to see what's going on in the building just yes. across the street. And then she realizes with horror that that person is also looking back at her with field yes. glasses. And she's yes. like, oh my God. And, but um, the good news is that this book is becoming a movie. So I'm very excited about that. Um, this is something that I'm really pleased about. I've had a couple of books that have become movies and I'm really, really thrilled about this one, especially in, in the year of a pandemic. Can you imagine <laughs> to have that kind of good news? Um, it was like, you know, a wonderful, wonderful surprise for me, and I haven't yet seen um, a any any draft yet of the of the script, but I know that the the young director is really very keen on the book, and this is a big French producer who's 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 bought it, and they haven't decided yet whether it's going to be in English or in French. That's because I, I wrote the book in two languages, as, as I think I told you. Yeah. Um, so they, I, they haven't decided yet what language it's going to be in. I think probably French. And, uh, and as you know, it always takes a while for scripts to be written and then films to be shot. And then, of course, there's this huge jam of all these 
films that were supposed to be coming out and that didn't because of the pandemic. So my guess as it is, is that it probably won't be on the screens until another, what, I'd say two, three years. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> how, how possessive are you of that? Do you, do you, do you let it go and, and allow the director I've learned to make his vision? Because I, I talked yes. to, I talked I've learned to, to let it go. Michael Cunningham years ago about the hours and, and he said he just felt that you have to allow the director to bring yes. their vision and it's not going to be literally your book, but hopefully it will be in the spirit yes. of you. And in fact, I've realized now that if it is literally your book, that sometimes makes it a less strong movie because the director has to put his or her imprint into it, has to bring out something personal. Um, and I, I've, I've been lucky to have uh, four books that have been adapted um, here in France. And every time there's been something different from the book. And I've, and I've learned to accept that. And, and yeah. some readers, however, some readers are really stuck. It's like their book and they want their vision. And I've noticed that many fans, many like of my hardcore fans, yeah. don't like the movie that was made of Sarah's Key, for example, because they feel right. it's not faithful to their own personal um, ver vision of the book. But I've learned to, re to be very relaxed about it. The only thing I, 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 I ask <laughs> is that the, um, I, I like to have a little cameo role in each movie. <laughs> I just like to be like, you know, Hitchcock appearing yes. in, 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 in the back. And then sometimes my readers say, yeah, yeah, we saw you, that's you. Um, I, I like that, and then and 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 for this, for but for, for, for flowers of darkness, um, I will uh, I will have a role. He promised me one. Right. <laughs> so right. A new career awaits. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like a lot of readers. I've talked to readers who want the film character be to be the, exactly the way they envision the person. But I'm a kind of a weird reader in that I have sort of a, a pastel sketchy view of the characters when I'm reading a novel. So, you know, like as far as who will play your uh, your protagonist role, I, I I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. And I think any good Helen, actress Helen, of- Helen, Helen Mirren or Glenn Close. Both of them would be great. I know, they really would. <laughs> 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 so if anybody knows them, please write. <laughs> Um, that have, would be so fantastic. I mean, and you've provided a juicy role for a woman of a certain age, which is yes, rare. I'm so proud that this, so, so Clarissa is in her early 70s, yeah. which in 15 years time will still be very young because yes. her dad is 99. Okay. Yes. So perhaps 70 was considered old at a certain epoch. But I think nowadays people are, are you know, living to be so much older so she's my first senior character, and I'm really thrilled because she was a very endearing um, character to shape. She has her her rather difficult past um, and all, all the traumatic stuff that happened to her, but she's she's got this incredible energy. She's um, she's got this physique too. She's she's this very tall woman with very blazing blue eyes. And she dyes her hair auburn and she wears um, these badass boots and, and leather jackets. And she, 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 she hates being, she hates being considered old, although right. she completely accepts that she is. Right. And she has a wonderful relationship with her granddaughter, who's 15 years old, called Adriana. Everybody calls her Andy. And Andy is the only one who really understands that Clarissa is going through something very difficult in this residence. And that yes, somebody is probably spying on her grandmother and who is behind all this? And is this just Clarissa's paranoia? Is this something else? And I want to point out that in this book, I don't give all the answers. And some readers are very annoyed with me about that. That, that, that again is Daphne du Maurier's fault. She always ended her books on this big question mark. Remember the end yes. of Rebecca? Yes. I forget the movie because Hitchcock gives answers. But if you read Rebecca, you will know, you know, you don't know who, who, who does whatever, I don't want to ruin it right, for anybody, but right, right. <laughs> there are so many things you don't know at the end of Rebecca. And in this book, I try to explain that I don't think writers should give all the answers because if they do, if we tailor a perfectly happy ending with the little curtain coming down, yep. you know, everything and 
ends happily ever after, then, then the reader will not continue to imagine what could have happened. My message is very simple in this book is the future is a worrying place. How do we make it safer for ourselves? This is what Clarissa does. What would you have done had you been in her shoes? But I don't give all the answers because I think that writers are here to make you think, not to put the dots on your eyes and to give you all the answers that we don't have, especially this book takes place in the near future. Yeah. How would I have all the answers to what's going on in the near future? I don't. I just have a paranoid um, <laughs> character character who has given me the opportunity to explore all our fears about the future. And we all have these fears. I'm sure we all do, all, all of you who are listening to me, the future is a scary place, right? It's not something that we, especially, can you imagine, look, look, look at what, what's been happening to us in the past year. How could anybody have seen that? It is scary. I mean, even the most amazing screenwriter couldn't have thought up something like that. And we're not out of it yet. <laughs> And the great thing about setting it in the near future is that we feel like we could be a part of this scenario, you know what I mean? And, and we bring ourselves to it. How, how are we going to be 10 or 15 years down the road? You know? Exactly. And, and as far as ambiguity goes, I feel to me that that's like the gift the author gives me to allow me to take the story and ponder where it's going. That's right. That's right. And I think that Clarissa being really a sort of... Um, I mean, she has a lot of charisma. She's very endearing. And so many of my readers have, have loved her and they care for her and they feel for her and they, 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 they're scared for her. So I just want to point out that this, this ending, even if it has a huge question mark, yeah. it's a very peaceful one. So please don't be worried. Don't think that I've written something hideous where you know, <laughs> ghastly things happen yeah. and there's a sex robot and how awful. No, there are yeah. moments. And another thing I want to point out that this is also a book about writers and how they inhabit their own personal places. The two important writers in this book are Virginia Woolf and Romain Gary, who's a famous French writer. And, and, and they appear in the book in a very particular way because the place where a writer writes, remember, Clarissa, remember Virginia Woolf and A Room of, of One's Own, the place where a writer writes is as important as a writer's mind. And this is where I'm trying to take you in this book, into a writer's mind, because Clarissa is a writer. So it's a journey into a, a, a writer's mind, a writer who has a very vivid imagination, but that's our job, that's what we do. If we exactly. have imagination, we'd be, I'd be doing something else. I wouldn't be talking to you here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and crucial to her is the fact that she thinks in two languages and in the yes. book, experimenting with a dual language novel. And I, my understanding is that you wrote this story in both languages. Simon. I did. This was the first time I did it. And I can show you the beautiful American edition. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the beautiful brand new um, push edition. Wow. Of Les Fleurs de l'Ombre. This is Clarissa coming down the stairs with her cat Chablis. <laughs> yes. And so I wrote this book simultaneously at the same time. I went from French to English. I don't know how I did it. I, I usually write my books either in French and then they're translated into English, not by me, where I write them in English and they're translated into French, not by me. But this time, because I'm studying hybrid brains in this book, and right. Teresa has a hybrid brain, I really, and it was actually quite an extraordinary experience to write this book at the same time, going from l'anglais au français en permanence. En fait, je n'ai pas eu besoin de choisir la langue. Um, as I can switch d'une langue à l'autre very easily, ce n'est pas difficile pour moi. Et au fond, j'ai réalisé, I've never really chosen the language that I prefer. I have two writing languages and I wanted to explore both of them here. So that's something I really have in common with Clarissa. Being bilingual and being able to write in both languages, um, which is something which is quite interesting in a way because you really feel like you have this hybrid brain. Yes. Um, you know, you, you've heard of hybrid cars. Yes. Okay. Well, we have hybrid brains. And for example, I don't know what language I, I dream in. I don't know what language I count in. Um, when I meet a bilingual person, I, we cannot choose which language we're going to speak in. On passe tout le temps du français à l'anglais. We give, give other people awful headaches. 
Um, and if you were to, to tell me, Joe, okay, which language, you have to choose a language. Right. You have to choose, a, which one would you choose? I would say, <laughs> okay, <laughs> Spanish, Italian, which I don't talk, <laughs> speak, but I cannot choose. This is, this is part of who I am. I'm a hybrid writer. <laughs> so just a, a brief technical thing. I mean, did you go like chapter one in French, chapter one? No, in absolutely not. I had, yeah. I had the English, I had the manuscript in English on one side and the manuscript in French on one side. And I just went from one to the other permanently. And I would just readapt as I went along. Mm. It was crazy. My husband would sometimes come into my study and say, you have smoke coming out of your ears. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about your new book coming out next month? Yes, I'm very happy. This is a book called uh, Celestine Dubac. I'm going to show you the lovely cover. Oh, that's beautiful. This is a book that I wrote quite a few years ago, but that I had, I, I, I lost the manuscript, believe it, believe it or not. It was in my cellar and I, for, I just forgot about it. It was turned down by my first publisher all those years ago because he found it inclassable. He, he find that he, he couldn't, but this, this is something that so many people have said about Sarah's Key when I tried to get Sarah's Key published 10 years later, everybody said, oh no, no, that book is inclassable. It doesn't, it can't be pigeonholed. So I had put Celestine away. And then recently I came across the only existing manuscript paper edition. Can you believe it? In my cellar. Wow. And I read it and I thought, wait a minute, there's really something going on here. So I gave it to my publishers here in France. This is a book I wrote in French. And they absolutely fell in love with it because, believe it or not, with the pandemic going on, it has an extraordinary resonance today. It's the story of a friendship between a young man who's completely locked up in himself, who wants to be a writer, who's a loner who's a dreamer, who doesn't get on very well with his father, who lost his mom in a plane crash. And one day on the street, he happens to see this bag lady who he'd never really noticed before. And she's, she's a bag lady of a certain age. And she's, you know, obviously had a very tough life. And nobody really looks at her because she's on the street. But this friendship is struck up between them. And this story is how she is going to help him spread his wings become a writer. He's fascinated by Emile Zola. He wants to write a book about Zola. And it's how she helps him become the young man that he's going to be, become a writer, face his family history. And it's also a story about friendship, which is something that's so important to us today. I mean, don't you miss your friends? You oh. know, don't you miss getting together with your friends and, and also giving a voice to all those people who are on the streets those homeless people who are still there. Um, so it's a book like coming out of lockdown. <laughs> it's a book that's been under lockdown for nearly 30 years and which has an extraordinary echo today. And what's very exciting is that it's being picked up by a lot of foreign publishers. Um, so I'm really, it's, it's quite strange having a book coming out that you wrote all those years ago and that's touching so many people today. Yeah. So it's like a, a new adventure for me. <laughs> that sounds like it has a lot of movie possibilities as well. Yes, it does. It's getting a lot of interest. Absolutely. And then I'm writing, I'm writing a new book that I started to write, um, well, a little earlier than I planned because uh, with the lockdown and the fact that we can't travel, then I've, you know, I've had to get to work. So I'm writing a new book, which is uh, not quite yet finished, but which I'm deep into. And, uh, but I can't tell you more about that because I'm superstitious. Of course, of course. <laughs> now, I think we have some questions from Great. Uh, Melissa and Renee. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, we have a question from Marsha. She would like to know what language you use for your other books. And Gail would like to know how much control you have over who, translate your, who translates your works when okay. you're not writing in both languages. So I usually write either in English or in French. Um, most of my books, like Celestine Dubac, for example, was written directly in French. And Manderly Forever, for example, my biography of Daphne du Maurier was written in French because it was um, a book that I was asked to write in French. But Sarah's Key, I wrote in English, and the other story I wrote in English. Um, so like I said er earlier on, I don't really choose the language, it comes to me. Now I know that, um, I will probably adapt my own work 
I probably won't do it simultaneously because that was really, <laughs> uh, that was very good for Flowers of Darkness because it gave me a lot of, you know, uh, interesting angles for the, for that book. But no, I think I'll adapt myself. Um, I still can't choose which language I like best. So I will probably go on adapting myself. And as for the translators, well, I have to admit, I am their nightmare. <laughs> because if I'm translating it, translated into a language that I don't read or understand, like, you know, Italian or Spanish, I, mean, right. I understand it a little bit, but I can't, whatever. It's very, I think it's very complicated for um, translators to feel comfortable with me because they're probably thinking, hey, wait a minute, why is she not translating herself? She's so bilingual. But for, for a long time, I was told not to translate myself. I was told that I couldn't do it. And I believed that until I tried, tried translating myself, which I was happy to do. But I've noticed also that if I am to translate myself or auto adapt or whatever you call it, it has to be with a very recent book. For example, Celestine Dubac, I couldn't translate it myself because I wrote it a long time ago. But translation is really actually quite fascinating. And I go into that in great detail in Flowers of Darkness. It, it is a fascinating thing. So I hope I answered those questions properly. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's see, we also have a question about which books have been adapted into movies already. Okay. So unfortunately, I don't think these have come to the States at all. Um, the book that the, in French is called Boomerang. And I think that in English it's called A Secret Kept. That became a, a very successful movie called Boomerang in France with Laurent Lafitte and Mélanie Laurent. Then there's another book called Mocha, which has not been translated to, into America, but has come out in many other countries. Um, that has become a successful movie in France, too, with Nathalie Baye and Emmanuel De Vos. Then there is Sarah's Key, of course, which I think many of you have seen with Kristen Scott Thomas. And then there's another movie called, um, there's a book called Spiral which I wrote in French and has not been translated, which they unfortunately changed the title. They call it Tout Contre Elle, which I don't find a very good title, which is a thriller. And that was made into a TV movie that came out on Arte here um, in France about, I'd say, a year or two ago that was very successful. I, I, I didn't realize that a, a TV movie could be so, so successful. And then, of course, now there's Flowers of Darkness, which... Uh, which is being uh, worked on as we as we speak, and which is for me, you know, incredibly exciting. Well, that's it for the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Gail, who said that Ted Chang's book of short stories called Exhalation addresses the issue of technology and artificial intelligence in our lives in a scary and imaginative way. Are you familiar with that collection? No. I'm not, but I'm delighted to get, have have those details because all those those all those elements inter interest me very much now that I've written this. So, that, mm -hmm. so thank thank you for the tip. <laughs> and um, Robbie states that given our discussion about bookstores at the beginning of the session, yes. have you have you read a book called The Paris Library? Yes, of course. And I even gave a wonderful blurb for it. Ah, okay. The true story about the librarians during World War II. Absolutely, the French mm -hmm. the French publishers asked me to blurb it for the for the French edition, which I happily did. It's a lovely book. Uh, do you have a fan book club? A fan book club? What do you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, Leah asked the question. I guess it's um, uh, a group of fans. Your, your well, hardcore I, fans, do they have? Well, a, I, they, they, they're, they're all on the internet. I mean, they're all on social media. And I, and mm -hmm. I, I have a Facebook page, a Twitter feed, Instagram, uh, TikTok. So they know how to find me. <laughs> so, yes, I do have a big fan base. <laughs> and what I love about my fan base is that it can go from very young people in their teens, because some of them were very sensitive to a book that I wrote called The Rain Watcher, which is about coming out. Um, and, um, and I, I got so, so much, so many messages from young people who had just, um, tried to come out to their parents and, uh, were in difficulty about this. So, so I've gained a lot of young readers through that book, which is very touching for me, really. And sometimes, you know, we, we talk and, uh, some of them sometimes send me little presents 
And every time I go on book tours, which is not the case, as I've just told you, I'm very spoiled by my fans. They know I love chocolate. They know I love blue. Um, <laughs> they know I love um, flowers. So I get all these things when I, <laughs> when I, when I do my book signing. It's so nice. And now I've realized another thing: when you, when you, when you do your book signings, in the old days, people were just happy with you know your signature in the book. And now, of course, there's the selfie. They all mm -hmm. want their selfie with yes. you. And some of them are so nervous when they're doing the selfie, they can't hold the phone. The phone is shaking. <laughs> so there has to be somebody taking the photo. <laughs> Otherwise, it goes on for ages. But people are incredibly patient. And they're, because they want their selfie as well, they're willing to wait for their own selfie. But it adds on like time. So, <laughs> you know, it adds on like hours to the, to the queue. But I mean, I'm very happy to start selfies again <laughs> when, <laughs> when we can. <laughs> Um, if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. And question? then, of course, I can be can I, I can be reached on my. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was Go ahead. Thinking, yeah. So um, I, uh, I, I had men, I was the one that mentioned the Paris Library that she yes. sent the librarians during World War II and their resistance efforts, getting books to subscribers that were no longer allowed in the library, and showed how literature could be a means of escape and a catalyst for human connection. And I wrote that just before I looked at the cover jacket and noticed your comment yes. book <laughs> to her. And you said, as a Parisian, an ardent bookworm and a longtime fan of the American Library in Paris, you devoured it in one gulp. What Absolutely. Has been, what has been your relationship with, um, with Janet, Char Janet Skesley and Charles? Have you... Uh, talked with her? Have you exchanged ideas in terms of writing books, that kind of thing? No, not at all. No, no, absolutely not. I met her uh, quite a while ago because she was in charge of the author events at the American Library in Paris, which I, you know, usually attend and I love attending them and, and all the events there are hugely successful, but now, alas, all online. So, I didn't know she had written this book and I was contacted by her French publisher, Jean-Claude Lattès, um, who said, look, would you like to read this book in the American edition? And if you like it, could you blurb it? So I did. And uh, so I probably only met her once about 10 years ago, um, but I was, I was very glad to, to blurb that book for her because it's a, it's a very good book. And that, that's all I know about her. I mean, we, we like each other's pictures on Instagram, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Well, that's all the questions that we have in the chat. Okay, great. So I think if we have no other questions, I think everybody needs to, to hop on the internet and, and, and buy the book <laughs> immediately. And I think many of us, I mean, first of all, an enormous thank you to you, Tatiana. Oh, you're welcome. It was so nice Joe, to be who We love dearly from the Alliance Francaise of Greenwich. And, and, and Thanks so much. And I have to say, I was not just personally, both Joe and I were big fans of Mocha. It was a great film. Oh, Absolutely. I'm so glad. Great film, yes. Which I, I really which, liked that film too. Which and I, I saw and, in Paris. And they made into something, they made it into something very different, mm -hmm. but the, the, the core of the book is still there. And I thought that they did a very great job. And it was the first time that Emmanuel De Vos and Nathalie Bay were together on screen. And, uh, and, I, and, and I actually, didn't you see me in that movie? I have a tiny role in it. <laughs> I don't think I knew what you look like then. So I'll, I have okay, to watch, well, I'll watch it again. When, when Nathalie Bay, just before Emmanuel de Vos goes into her beauty shop mm -hmm. right, for reasons that we will not reveal, yeah. I am the client having her nails done. Okay, okay. Oh. And Just Natalie not Bai is doing my nails and she did such a bad job of it. I can't tell you. It was hysterical. And I had to keep a straight face. And she was just like, I can't tell you what she did to my nails. I had to, well, I had to keep a, poke, a poker face. I was, I was being filmed. So well, now I'm when sure you see, you'll, you'll, see that. <laughs> no, but I don't yeah, think she I, was either. Oh, that's so funny. Um, but I think everybody should, should be looking forward to reading Celestine Dubac. And then hopefully Thank getting you. together with you again and learning more about the film. To. And, um, I would love to. Please don't hesitate to contact me again. Really, be delighted. Well, thank you so much, and thank you. Thank you, you to thank all you. of you. Thank Merci you. Merci beaucoup yeah. de tout cœur. Bonne journée, bonne soirée. Au revoir. Au revoir. Merci. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye.